guess. <laughs> okay, good. Let's see it. Uh, okay, good. So, I'm on. Oh, yes, no. Okay, here we go. So I just want to say a little bit about my from what what's my perspective on this problem. And and you know, actually, a number of people have said like I'm not really in EPRV, and I'm also not really in EPRV. I'm involved in terror hunting, but I really work on data analysis. My interest is computational data analysis, and I like EPRV because it's hard. I want to do problems that are hard. This is a nice hard problem. Um, I am super, when it comes to spectroscopy, I couldn't be more data driven. We literally made a completely data driven, these models are, are so data driven, they're actually like too data driven. Um, the Canon is something that replaces stellar models for doing abundance work. And actually its biggest problem is that it forgoes theory entirely. It just works on the self-consistency of the spectra. Wabla is our model for doing uh, radial velocity measurements, and that treats the stellar spectrum and the telluric spectrum as completely free functions of wavelength with no constraints whatsoever. And uh, Excalibur is a latent space model for a spectrograph that also has no opinion about the physics of optics. The only opinion it has about the optics is that they will be low dimensional. Um, and so all of these are actually ridiculously uh, low, like data driven, but but the main thing we've been talking about is that stellar variability actually does have a lot of theoretical backing, and in fact, I think Xavier mentioned that this is like physics that's been known since the '70s, um, and and we are we and so even though I'm very very data driven, I actually think you want to do data driven in a way that respects somehow the physical ideas you have. It's not exactly that you want to build a correct physical model, but when you build a data driven model, you want it to have the flexibility that of the physics you expect to be there, or that would somehow cover the physics that you expect to be there. So, most important thing that I'm excited about is that. These different causes for, and I notice I don't use the word activity. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I don't even know what faculty are, and apparently no one does, but whatever. I can't uh, but spell it, it either. <laughs> but, oh, I, yeah, I don't know how to spell it either. It's a feminine word, uh, not a masculine word. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, each of these causes have, um, different freedoms, they have different spectral freedoms. Some things only obey or only appear in certain parts of the spectrum, some appear everywhere. They have different time correlations. Granulation is happening on a totally different time scale than spots are being created and differential rotation. And they produce different kinds of spatial maps on the surface of the star. And although we don't get to see the spatial map of the star, what's the observation? It's an integration of the spatial map of the star. So somehow the spatial map of the star must matter. Okay, good. Um, oh, so I knew that. <laughs> if anybody gets into any of my documents, that something turns into Comic Sans. <laughs> it's not my fault. But though apparently it's good for people with certain kinds of um, cognitive uh, 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 specialties. Anyway, um, the future of our EPRV is to model the stellar surface. And I hope it, it, the next line, we're not going to discuss that because that's so obviously true. Why would we even discuss it? That's just not up for discussion. Duh, that's what we're doing. We're going to start modeling the stellar surface. And actually in the starry session, we really started to get close to thinking about how would you model the whole stellar surface? Um, okay, I'd now. like to know if there is anyone who is with that. Uh, <laughs> Who could disagree? I mean, there might, there might be. <laughs> there, there will actually be a discussion session where this is actually, I am actually going to bring this back up, but it is a good question. Does anybody think that wouldn't help us or would be? Oh, maybe that it's too hurting. hard or that it won't help well, us compared to the amount of work that it involves. It's definitely too hard. I love data analysis problems that are too hard. So that is, but yeah, go ahead. I think what we have to do this with, to a certain level. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go too much into the complexity. Right. Yeah. In yeah. fact, like I was saying yesterday, that indeed a lot of people was doing the sun and learning about, about spectral lines and so on. And since the 70s, the 80s, they started to look at super high resolution spatial uh, and spectro uh, in spectroscopy as well to very small region of the sun 
And then the physics there is so complicated that yeah. you don't want to start to go into these details because, because then you're going to be lost. Agreed. So, Agreed. And so what we really want to know from these kind of physical models is very, very general things. Like one thing that we learned yesterday is we should be thinking about the photospheres having layers and different parts are coming from different depths. Another thing we should think about is time scales. We kind of know convective turns over time scales. We don't need to understand the full convective pattern on the surface of the sun, but we definitely need to know about convective time scales and kind of the spherical harmonic degree of the effects. Things like that. So I agree with that completely. That that is, a, and when I say, and of course, when I would say model of a stellar surface, you know, model can mean a lot of different things to different people. For me, models are always effective models. Actually, I'm not a realist. I don't actually think there even is a stellar surface. Uh, I just think that that's what our theory of stars is, and therefore we should use it. I don't believe there's an electron either, by the way. If you want to talk about that for dinner. We have online someone that disagrees. Oh, so the reason at least there is an electron? It's Eric. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Oh, it's Eric Ford, let me guess. Eric, okay. <laughs> Go, Eric. Is that conceptually, it's a nice approach, but I'm not convinced that it's practical or necessary. Good. Good. I, I understand it might not be necessary, and I'm going to talk about, actually, I think what's interesting about this point of view, the point of view in Comic Sans, is that even if you adopt this point of view, it doesn't mean you actually literally have to instantiate a model of the surface of the sphere of the star. It just means you have to be building effective models that are equivalent to that. And in fact, Rodrigo's discussion and it, or actually his um, presentation at the beginning today was a bit like that. You know, he makes these models of spots, but so that he can marginalize it out and you don't have to think about it anymore. So it could have that form too. Um, okay, good. Now, the next thing I want to say, which is part of my, the other part of my title, is spectrographs measure way more than the CCF, the RV, and a bunch of, like, whatever things they're called, bisectors. I don't even know what any of the definitions are. Um, uh, we literally, literally, there's hundreds of thousands of pixels uh, extracted in the express spectra that we've been working with. Um, in principle, any pixel in that spectrum that is that ever touches a, a spectral line is giving you information about the state of the star and the radial velocity. And, um, and then Xavier just spoke directly to my heart yesterday when he showed us 2D images. And his point was, well, you have to be careful because the 1D extractions uh, are complex and are hiding stuff. But what the real thing you were supposed to hear when he was saying that is that we should be working in 2D. <laughs> we should not be doing 1D extractions. And in the long run, we will not work, do 1D extractions. That will not happen in the long run. In the short run, it's very useful, but in the long run, we will definitely be in 2D. Because if the, there is no way that the 1D extraction helps you. It is strictly non-better to extract and then do your RV work. Because, say again? It's easier though. But it's easier. So once again, relating to Eric Ford's comment on the, and also Xavier's comment, we might still extract, we might still extract if we can absolutely show you're not losing anything by extracting. Although I can currently prove that flat relative work, optimal attraction and spectral perfectionism both lose RV information in extraction. So we are losing RV information at the extraction step currently. Um, Good, and this is also not up for discussion because obviously this is correct. So what is up for discussion? Okay, good. So if I had to summarize the first day of this meeting and what I thought was gonna be kind of the whole point of this meeting is that uh, low dimensional latent models are incredibly powerful for EPRV. And in fact, it really starts with Suzanne's F F squared and F, F prime model, where which was a very nice idea that maybe there's a single latent variable that varies smoothly with time that messes up your RVs, messes up your photometry, and does so in a way that's related. That's a that what in my language that's a one-dimensional latent variable model. And, and it's trying to compress that model in some sense compresses all the complexity of the stellar surface into one variable and then hopes that that one variable is explanatory. And then we learned that it works very well in some cases and doesn't cover everything. So there were some nice talks about that. And, and Quang has a nice 
poster that shows that if you go to two latent variables, you do a little better. Why do you do a little better with two? Well, Kwong may disagree and other people may disagree, but I think it's because one latent variable is not enough to summarize the whole surface of the star. The surface of the star does more things. Now the question is, does the surface of the star do two things? Probably not. It probably does some number other than two things. <laughs> so the first point of discussion, and then of course, so one question is, should we just keep adding GPs? What is the future of this approach? Um, and don't, I remember I said that I claim that the different variabilities have different time dependencies and spatial maps, and they should appear in the spectrum differently. Good. Oh, look, there's a URL, which somebody who I'm guessing is from New York guessed. And, um, and uh, it's got to be somewhere from New York because it turned to Comic Sans. I'm looking in that general direction. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, uh, good. Do people have thoughts about this? Huang, I put you on the spot. Do you have thoughts? I have, yeah. This is, I, just, I mean, that's sort of, uh, we actually started from the FF Prime. Like, that was the initial, like, let's go over this and look at this. Um, and the approximation, of course, holds very, very well, but then moving into the GP space, right, the multidimensional framework that Vinesh and everyone um, and Oscar have really developed um, is really interesting, but I wanted to reduce, I actually kind of went backwards and reduced it down to just photometry and RV, thinking like, let's say you don't have your activity indicators, and let's say that, and this is why I asked you that question earlier, of like, what if you don't have flux like activity indicator, right? Like you need one of those things. Well, yeah. Why don't we just use photometry, even though we lose that spectral line, but are we really using that spectral line to change information anyways? In any case, with the two latent variables, I like it. I, I'm always, people have asked me like, why two? And there's like that argument of like you're saying, that it's gonna be more latent stuff happening on the surface or that contributes to these things. Um, part of the argument, of course, is also in the FF prime method, the RV contributions have it from the F and the F squared components, the, the convective and the radio rotation terms. So those, you could think of those contributing in two, one in two ways. Um, should we go to N GPs? I don't know, that's like where. where so imagine, so in my, my imagined future, we would be modeling every pixel in the spectrograph as a mixture of the latent variables. So if you had K latent variables, we'd be if now. So you, one thing that's interesting about all these multiple Gaussian process things is people have generally been working with only a few indicators. They work with RV and the bisector or RV and the and the photometry or something like that. And like maybe we should be uh, maybe we should be thinking um, about adding. So imagine you were trying to fit many channels of data like like the whole spectrum or maybe if you don't want to do the whole spectrum some particular line depths or line asymmetries or something um, then presumably you would need more gps right isn't the reason you need two gps basically because you're using two channels yeah that's i mean that's also if you yes the re the reduced down argument is that but then mm -hmm. if you add more channels um are you i always worry about this overfitting like you have N channels, then you have N GPs. Is that really good? So there is obviously a physical argument to stop it somewhere. I mean, I, I think the, the need for- sorry. I agree with the comment that got written in the document. Feel free to write in there, people. Here, were you gonna say something about that? No, I, I think even for the same time scale, there's, you know, this is something that uh, comes back to the no the space that, um, that Rodrigo was demonstrating this morning that, the null spaces of the RVs and the photometry are different. So if you, I'm not sure how easy it is for a single GP that isn't based on a physical representation of the stellar surface to explain both. So even with the same time, time scale. Good. So I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about dimensionality reduction and then, and then later. Discussion point is dimensionality reduction, but it is very interesting whether if you add more and more channels, does the complexity of the problem, how does the complexity of the problem grow as you add more channels? Just somehow related, yes. So just coming back to the thing we shouldn't 
be discussing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 No one, no one would, no one could doubt that. Yes. Uh -huh. Are you about to doubt the thing no one could doubt? So when you have the spectrum on your CC, okay, <clears throat> uh, the spectrum is average of a set of pixels. Yes. In the cross dispersion. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. 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 So we all know that pixel, like if you take a pixel, it's not like perfectly flat, whatever. You yeah. Have yep. activity and yeah. So once you like concatenate the information, you've compressed the information in just one extracted spectrum, then you start to average out a little Some, bit. Yeah. Yes. And then having a model where you are really able to model the 2D images, yeah. then because you have very low signal to noise, yeah. also at exactly time, at each pixel, yeah. It would be difficult, like, to model all those different things that we don't necessarily know about, but when we extract things magically, yeah, well, right. Sure, good. Uh, so I'm, I have I a yeah, good. To together. I have a discussion thing about the instruments. My last discussion point is literally about the instruments. So make sure we come back to that. Okay. I think it is very important. There is a very important point that extraction does do one useful thing, which is it averages over pixels. Like when you do. Uh, tests or Kepler photometry, right? You average over a little pixel patch. And if you work on the individual pixels, they're worse. I've done a lot of stuff at the pixel level with Kepler and it's way worse. And and so the averaging does help you in a lot of ways. Yeah. So let, we'll come back to that when we, but that's a very good, yeah. we're, I, we're off the instrument right now. We're coming back to the instrument. Though. Good. Anybody else want? Yeah. Just to point on the number of Gaussian processes that you yeah. need. Uh, I, I think you can marginalize on that. So, you know, you, you mm -hmm. can compare the different models. You can try with one, two. Uh, this, this is the spirit of the Jones uh, 2017 paper where, you know, you try everything and uh, and then you you have the relative merits of all the different options uh, yeah. with the model comparison. Yeah, if somebody's in the document, can they type uh, model averaging there? Yeah. Just, I mean, just I think to remind in, me. In June, it was slightly different because there were they were trying different combinations of deriv not different numbers of derivatives, yeah. but but it's the same sort. Yeah. Of, yeah, and they do a simplified model comparison because otherwise that would be too yeah. really expensive. But you could literally do the model averaging, right? You could instantiate every number and model average. Yeah. No, I mean that's that's. And I, I think with time we will see what are the models that keep popping up as the best keeping, ones. Yes. Uh, and so we, we don't need to search in such a yeah. uh, high dimensional space of models and, and restrict progress. Actually, one of the things Rodrigo talked about in the tutorial, or no, in his talk, was about um, that he's reduced the space of kernels if you care about spots. And the same thing could easily happen when we think about granulation. Somebody, if we work hard enough on granulation, we might be able to reduce the set of kernels that are relevant for granulation or convective blue shift or whatever. So, good. Uh, Unless somebody has like another yeah, comment. Yeah, good. Hit me. I was curious if folks have thoughts. You know, right, the, the paragraph we have now is kind of breaking up the effects of different types of activity or whatever word we've all decided to <laughs> Variability. <laughs> yeah. Um, if thinking kind of a, a step before that, is there value or merit to trying to do GPs for different families of lines, whether those are lines formed by different elements or lines formed in different layers of the photosphere, chromosphere, et cetera. Pro element families into the document because that's an important idea. I have no idea what the answer is, but it's something we're like, again, reaching out more to the heliophysics folks and saying, do you guys have classifications where you know that these lines behave similarly either due to their you know, elemental origin or how and where they are formed might be an interesting as you're doing uh, line by line analyses. So in, in the in the stellar abundance world, so uh, Melissa Ness, one of the things she's been doing is like late follow on from Canon stuff was looking at what parts of the spectrum move together. And you can see line families move together as you go from star to star. Yeah. We're actually asking what parts of the spectrum move together as you go from time to time uh, in the same star. But I think I think if you if we if we structure things well, you would you should be able to discover that. In fact, it should just be sitting there in the data we already have. But since we're rarely looking at it at the pixel level, we don't notice. Didn't we see some of that in Michael Cretini's talk? Yes, I was, when yes, he was comparing the, the shell. That's right. The, the same shell, but for different families of lines, yeah. lines and shallow lines. Exactly, yeah. Sure. Yes, exactly. It was very nice. And in fact, I'll mention that again, or maybe I did up above. But anyway, that was very important to me because that was a rare example where after he found an effect, 
he could then go back and project the data onto that effect and then see how are the different lines participating in that interaction. And, and, um, and uh, uh, that is exactly, we, one of the things we're not doing enough of is looking in the residual, in literally the pixel residuals, because in the pixel residuals, and he was doing a nice thing where he stacked the lines of different strengths. And so it was, so he could get very high signals to noise measurements of the lines. He didn't have to look at ratty little residuals. He was looking at very high signal to noise residuals because he was uh, averaging over the lines of different types. Good. Some of the comment, but yeah. Yeah. So like, and I'm glad this discussion, I was, I was weird. I put this up and everyone would be like, I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. So I think there is two aspects. One, there is like, trying to model everything to you. Okay. Yeah. And then there is trying to see what we can do on the spectra that we have, because so far we are, we are using velocities and a few proxies and that's it. Yeah. I think my guess would be that we already have so much to learn at the spectral level, mm -hmm. the spectral level yeah. that we should first. We should do that it. for sure. And then keep the even most difficult problem for after, which I is really, I think. But I we agree. still have a lot of things to learn. I agree completely. And in fact, you'll see from my questions, I'm, I'm, I'm asking about what are the staged moves we make towards the future that we all agree we're going to be in. Of doing the whole star and the whole the star. star. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is, it's called consensus building. Uh, I've just done something terrible. Um, okay, good. I'm glad people are writing things in. If there's something that comes up in the discussion you think is worth recording, please do, because I, I, I'm obedient and I'm going to turn this into a document for Suzanne. I'm obedient. I, actually, I feel like this could almost turn into a white paper, but thank God that era is over. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Before we switch here, this this idea about like okay, let's have a GP for oscillations and for granulation and for your larger magnetic regions or whatever. Like, is it the right is that the right way of thinking that we want to treat each process separately because they're all mm -hmm. interconnected? Like the oscillations are there because of the convection, and the, like the spots are there because it's suppressed convection. Like they're all interrelated, so should we be fundamentally separating them? Great. I was actually so absolutely. I I, I don't I, I don't believe. Well, as I said, I'm not a realist. I don't even believe there's a seller service. I don't believe that even this separation of things is is actually correct. So I, I, I totally, absolutely. But actually one thing that occurred to me in the context of, the nice thing about Huang's project is it's, it's such a beautiful example of two Gaussian processes. It's like, it's like the first baby step towards this thing. And then if you have two Gaussian processes, now you could think about, are there mechanisms that that where they interact with each other. You could write down interaction terms. You could think about it like a particle physicist, right? You 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 could have like nodes and lines connecting the nodes. There could be like a diagram. And so basically there's one process and the other process, but occasionally they exchange particles. And you could and you could think about so even if we modeled it as purely separate phenomena, you still might then ask, well, but do we see interactions between the convective model and the uh, astroseismic model? We should. At some level, if you know the phases of all the astroseismic nodes, you should know something about the convection pattern. So in that context, how do you distinguish between those very physical interactions and overfitting? <laughs> I know, I know. So one thing, oh, and I didn't talk about that because I'm not, I wasn't put on for statistics, but if I had been put on for statistics, the thing I would be saying is what we all agree on is that cross-validation is how we're going to test whether and how we're making good predictions on the star. I, 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 and I, I actually, I said in my blog, I really love what you said at the end of your talk, because you, you, you represented the exact Bayesian opposite of my point of view on this. But then at the end of your talk, you made the point that everything's very sensitive to noise models. And I thought that was very good. And one of the ways that I protect myself against that is by always using cross-validation, or at least always looking at the cross-validation. It's such a valuable way to check whether you're wrong about your noise. Uh, but yes, overfitting is going to be a horrifying problem here. But I don't see what else we can do. It's actually complicated. 
it's actually kind of similar in some ways to large scale structure, right? Most of the information in large scale structure is the phases of the modes, which we don't care about. We only care about the amplitudes of the modes and even the amplitudes, we only care about like the amplitude, the slope and the baron acoustic feature. So we care about like three things about the large scale structure, but there's literally a billion phases that we just don't care about. And we just discard them. But, but it, so there's also kind of an overfitting problem like that in cosmology. Um, Okay, good. So this, some of this already came up, but I wanted to just especially emphasize that we, most people here are modeling particular spectral indicators, which are like things you measure off the CCF or maybe like H and K, calcium H and K infill or something. I don't know. I, I know nothing about it, but, um, but obviously we should be uh, <clears throat> taking an empirical approach to uh, the question of what are the, where are the spectral indicators which predict radio velocity mistakes or issues. And actually in ESSP, our contribution, so Lily, Megan, and my contribution to ESSP, we were allowed to contribute to ESSP, compete in ESSP, which is maybe like some kind of ethical issue. But, um, uh, but we, <laughs> Lily's like, you're done. Um, no, it's no competition exactly. ESSP was about building a community and understanding the relationships among methods. And we, we, our method was down to the spectral pixels and very few people were asking what in the spectral pixels predict the RV. But I have to say our results weren't extremely clear and we're working on trying to figure out more clarity there. But, but do people have ideas for things we could be doing here? Um, yeah. So, so you, you were saying that you but my approach was like the opposite of the way you look at things, but I, I don't think there's a, <laughs> there's a contradiction because uh, to me, well, what, what I was presenting is once you have a likelihood, how do you use it? That's right, yeah. But this to me is building the likelihood. Yeah, I, I don't think there's really a conflict. I think if, if the thing that I usually object to in like Bayesian decision theory is that your answers end up being very sensitive to the noise model yeah, you put in. Yeah, of course. But of course, this room is actually pretty sophisticated about their noise models. So I think I'm pretty confident we'll be able to. That, and that's why I really appreciated what you said at the end. I think. A lot of places that Bayesian decision theory has been used, like counting planets, they have these absurdities where you just want 20 planets. Yeah, sure. And sure. Because the noise models are but, but I think we can be sophisticated also about the way we see the likelihood mm -hmm. as conditioned on where you have discrete variables which are switching on the different hypotheses. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can have, so again, mm -hmm. an average mm -hmm. over, over them all you can. And, and, uh, and mitigate the... the yeah. The problem, uh, and I think the one way to to look at the best possible model of RV would be to find the minimalistic likelihood, which is representing as much data as we can. You know, so so for for the moment we are looking at the RV time series or RV time series plus a few indicators, but then this could be the time series of CCFs, the time series of spectra, the time series of spectra in two D of several stars at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and as we increase the data, we want the description part to, to be... To stay compact. To stay compact. Good. And that is, I think that's my next point, is about how to keep the description compact. Yeah, but I, I mean... But that's very important, yeah. But then we have model comparison tools which, yeah. are, we, which are designed to tell us if the, the, the compromise between being compact and being exhaustive is, is yeah. valuable or not. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. I, I'm just a little suspicious of the pure Bayesian way of dealing with that for various reasons. But I, but yes, and I, but there's also, of course, frequentist ways to deal with it as well. So yeah. there are different ways. But, but my I agree. It's not necessarily Bayesian. Sure, it's fine. just model comparison. Yeah, different model of like yeah. models of like. Fine. Yeah. Um. Somebody says feature learning problem. Anonymous dolphin may possibly be Eric Ford. Um. Uh. But. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. agreed, I agree, this is a feature learning. In, in the context of, of machine learning, this would be called the feature learning problem. And in some sense, you can think of the model that, that um, 
Lily and Megan and I put into ESSP is a two layer neural network. We didn't write it that way. We wrote it just as a linear model, but you're trying to find features which can then be averaged into an RV prediction. So it's like a, or a one layer uh, neural network, if you'd like. Um, and that layer is finding the features that predict the RV. But uh, good, other thoughts? I mean, we can apply the feature learning world to this. Yeah. But I just, have, I just want to say that when you do is photometry and transit, the feature between transit shape, like very short term, very specific shape compared to the signal from activity, uh, rotational activity is really completely different. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's it's quite easy to separate one from the other. In yeah. terms of radial velocity, the two yeah. have the same shape. They have the same shape. And that often the similar time scale. So it's really what makes the thing difficult. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I have a whole talk about transits where what my main point is that is like, how is it that we can find these tiny transits in this noisy light curve? And it's because the transit model is very rigid and has very strong structure. And the, the stellar variability is very weak and floppy and has all sorts of issues. And so then it, the, the, when you try to build a mixture of those two things, it just finds the transiting planet because of the structure. But here we have no separation in Fourier space or in spectral space. And that's why it was exciting to see the stuff about the other FF prime, to think about what are the statistics of the spectrum that are completely orthogonal to RV. It's kind of an interesting question. Yeah. I think I'm sort of about to say what you just said, but it, yeah. So as Xavier, you know, I often start my talks with exactly the point that you just made uh, about the separation for your space that you can exploit the transits not being present for RVs, but that's true in time series. It's Indeed. not true in line profiles and it's not true in spectra. We have to find a space where yeah. things can be separated. Exactly. That is exactly the idea of this, right? If we found the right things, you could, well, the, the ma magic that we're hoping for, that we, we've been working on, we're hoping for a magic where you can project the spectrum or the spectral residuals onto templates, and one of the templates will be the, some, or some, some like trigonometric comp, uh, combination of some template projections will be the rotational orientation of the star, you know, or 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 will be the spot area or whatever. So that's kind of the kind of thing we're thinking about. But, but we're thinking about those things because they're tractable. Uh, because we also, even though I want to model everything, you also have to model things that, I mean, I'm trying not to increase my carbon footprint beyond coming to this conference. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's already a little embarrassing. <laughs> So I was just going to come back to one thing slightly also uh, relating to what you said. We think about the problem being a lot easier for transits, but when we're going to ser search for Earth-like transits, mm -hmm. it's not going to be that easy, actually. And the variability timescales that we're going to have to worry about are, are going to become more similar because you have to worry about granulation. You have to yeah. worry about the tail end of activity. Yeah. No, and, and, and years ago, Dan Foreman Mackey and I and others did this search for single transits in Kepler. And when you go down to single transits, you lose a ton of the structure because you don't have any of the periodicity to help you. And then you, our sensitivity was way worse because single transit is way, even two transits was way more confidently identifiable in the, in the, spec, in the light curve than one transit. Yeah. I guess I want to pose a related or derivative question to the room um, about dimensionality reduction, because I think that currently um, we tend to uh, do these sorts of problems looking for a new activity indicator or doing some data driven PCA type of dimensionality reduction thing on a data set from one individual star at a time. And there's kind of this uh, there's this idea that, you know, different stars are going to have different physics, be dominated maybe by different processes, and therefore um, we want to customize our analysis to one star at a time. Um, but I, I would like to know, like, is that really the future? Or can we say that for a random example, I have a whole harp survey full of solar analog stars. Can I use all of those stars? at the same time to learn 
um, to reduce the noise on this dimensionality reduction problem? Or is that doomed because of the very individual nature of stars? I love that. I mean, that you said a similar thing yesterday. I was like, testify. This is, <laughs> I think this is the future. And it, when in, in one of the things that's a big theme in Flatiron is taking models and making them hierarchical, taking your model that you're doing of your each of the stars and let's hierarchy it. And then, and then you can get joint information. So that's got to be possible at some level. Like, if there's a physical world out there, it's the same physical world at each star. So it's right. got. So I guess at what level is it possible? Good. And I don't even know how to ask that question when it comes to. I barely know how to ask that question when it comes to astroseismology, and that's the easy case. Yeah. So I think it's really a way where we should go. Then the thing is that you have to put all the stars in the same like space where they can be compared. Because of course, if you just take it at the spectrum level, you take a star that is a, a little bit uh, hotter or cooler, you won't have the same spectrum. Right? So we'll not be able to do it at the spectrum level. It, no, it would have to be at a more latent level, I think. When probably. Michael presented yesterday, where you look at line depths and you average all the information, there indeed we start to be able to compromise. And from what I remember, mm -hmm. first Michael, you can make a comment on that, but basically he applied some PCA. So he did the PCA on stars that are very high signal to noise, looks like the signals. And then he was able to apply this to other stars. And it was able to uh, remove some systematics. It was not perfect. It was not the same as if you were taking the star and optimizing for it. But there was some similarities between the two. So indeed, yeah. Did you want to say something back to that, Megan? Yeah, I'm actually, I. I take your point, but I'm not sure that I agree that we can't do this at the spectral level because even if the even if the average spectrum of a given star looks different from another star, um, which we do have to correct for, is the derivative of that spectrum with respect to the activity process substantially <clears throat> different from right, another yeah. star? It's a great question. Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit this, like this FF1 is like taking the derivative, basically. So in that space, indeed, you can comp you can start to compare the stars, yeah. Can somebody type in the hierarchical point, the point that hierarchical might be really important here? Yeah. I'm curious if for the type of work you're describing, if that's something we need to think about at the survey design level mm -hmm. as well, because if you want to look at these families of stars, should we be planning to make sure we have similar signal to noise and cadences, you know, sampling? the same time scales of activity so that we're not looking at one star really intensely and one sparsely and then saying, oh, they don't match. But that's actually an observational bias and not due to the stars themselves. If anyone in this room was currently planning a large EPRV survey, there was, there's was there been a lot to learn already in this meeting. And I think we could phrase a lot of these questions in those terms. I think that's such an important point. I think there's a lot of possibility. I it, When I look at the existing e EPRV data, it's a little bit embarrassing what a mess it is. There are some very good surveys, but there's also a lot of mess. And I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that the next round of things is really well thought out. Um, I don't know how to do that because I don't have a model. <laughs> uh, should we keep going? Good hierarchy semi-plan. Right. Won't be large. Well, that is a problem. This is one of the problems. The, 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 like when we were looking at Terra hunting, like what is our possible target list? It's actually only hundreds of stars. And then it keeps going down. And so actually one of the weird things is at some point it might be that EPRV is the study of 80 particular stars that we all know really, really well. That is a possible weird scenario. I mean, that's NASA's viewpoint a little bit. It's like, you care about EPRV for the future yeah. LUVEX mission, and so there are 100 stars we're going to look at, and yeah, yeah. those are the ones they want to solve. By the way, is LUVEX the new name? No, there's IRUV is what is being used. IRUV. I-R-O-U-V. Because I don't sound too much like Lou also right now, and I don't know what to call it. Yeah, no, they, they had a name idea. They didn't want to use it. Hopefully there will be a new one because we're all hand waving right now. But but in, if you go back to the original HabEx proposal, it literally wasn't relying on ground base. It was going to just do all the stars it can do. That was the original HabEx. I don't know if it got modified when it went in. Well, that was, I think, 
That may have been, I don't know if it was the case for Habex, but for example, for HDST, which was kind of yeah. pre-casual, we were told you cannot rely on anything. It's, yes, exactly. It's not that right. it won't happen, yeah. is you just have to assume You have to assume happen. it won't happen because of risk, meaning. Oh, yeah. If it happens, then it can be much more efficient. Yes, right. Much more Good. And so I think... The irony is the bigger you make yeah. the, sorry, no, go ahead. the bigger you make the telescope, the more time you spend characterizing, because you can characterize a larger fraction of the planets that you find, and the less it matters whether you've done the survey beforehand. <laughs> so it's like if you can convince them to make it, you know, whatever, 10 meters instead of eight. It's going to be six plus or minus a bit. It's not the idea that it's not going to change much. But there are arguments from Rhonda Morgan about surveys ahead of time. And you increase your yield by a factor of two, and you find the planets sooner so that you can do more follow-up work yeah. with them during the survey. Near the, near the hierarchy, Point in here, can somebody put in that this has implications for experimental design? Because it's just such an important thing. By the way, I think one of the big things that our community could do is put the world into a much better state when NASA is about to launch that beast. We should be in a much better state. It's kind of part of our responsibility. We're going to like, mention this on Friday, um, no, tomorrow, and Heather and I think, yeah. but there is the first of two workshops that NASA is holding for the whole community to show up and say, here is the science that we need to do ahead of IRU. NASA has a budget that they are assigning for this over the next decade. And so I will be advocating for all of you to call in and say, here is why EPRV matters for doing the science you want of these you know, Earth analog temperate worlds. But it's not in the decadal. The decadal did not recommend EPRV, so we need to make the case for it, or it's not going to be a funding priority. Right. And one of the things, I mean, th this is for tomorrow, but one of the things that's interesting is that EPRV is obviously really in integrated into the time, like NASA's long term plan. But if it's not explicitly in decadal, it has to be made explicit. Yep. So, absolutely. Jen, what's the comment? Oh, and comment, it's, it's a slightly different topic, so I don't know yeah. how, if it will mess with your flow. No. But one What's one well? expression that we haven't heard mentioned this morning is time sampling. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I haven't said anything about time sampling, but actually... Uh, Maybe it will come up in a future description. Right, so yeah, I mean, uh, when Annalise showed the, the solar spectra, there she is, the first thing I thought was, oh my God, this has implications for how our time sampling, because if there's reliably two to three day lags going on, we have to think about that when we're observing. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I think related to this, it's funny that I've heard, I haven't heard us talking about time sampling, but I've heard quite a bit of us saying, we don't care about time sampling with this particular method. Mm -hmm. It's all, <laughs> it's all. Um, God, I couldn't disagree with that more. <laughs> well, I think it's, yeah, yeah. I, it's just, it's just yeah. we, we, we've heard that as soon as we go into the sort of wavelength space, we, we forget, yeah, we don't need time yeah. sampling. So, so I'm not sure we, that's we, a good direction. In a less direct way, because what happens is we don't explicitly take it into account when we're modeling the sequence of line profiles or whatever. I mean, not in LSD, but in, in some of the mm -hmm. other uh, methods. But you still need to sample the process that's giving rise mm -hmm. to the variations well mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. So you need enough observations taken at enough different points in phase and spanning the yeah. the 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 and also spanning well, the evolution of whatever's yeah. doing. Right, that. since it's incoherent yeah. processes, you have to keep yeah. doing that. You don't you get to do it just once and then live with it. But the other thing is that <laughs> you can you can do something crude uh, without taking the time something into account and the appeal of that is that you can apply it retroactively to existing time series which often don't have very good time something and you can learn a huge amount that, that could be no no that's very true and, yeah. but but in my my future the future that we all agree is ahead of us we will care deeply about time sampling because we need though otherwise we're going to put parts of the star into the null space because if we, we, we if we don't do the sampling well enough, we're going to move some of the star into the null space, and we care about it. Um, so, could somebody throw time sampling into the document? And I think that connects to the survey design. Good. Good. Very much. Very much. Very much. It's basically the same question. Yeah. As and in terms of how much freedom we have in order to do the observations, it's not. It's it's both the stars we're looking at and when we're looking at them. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. 
Anyway, yeah. In terms of practicality, though, don't you? I mean, there's some things you just need to, for efficiency's sake, need to like shunt into null space, right? Like pulsations. There's no need for us to have like you know, or for some stars, maybe like. On that know. one, I actually exactly disagree. We can actually beat the nulling with a better strategy than nulling. Uh, we have a better strategy that nulls it harder than integrating over it. But but you're right. In principle, there could be some forms of uh, variability that That's could granulation. just know by your, <laughs> but, but right, yeah, yeah. No, and, and you could also imagine things that involve combinations. I'm having deja vu right now. You can imagine things that have combinations of observables that would effectively null certain things, and then you just can forget about them. Really. I don't know that that's true, though, and I think it segues into your instrument thing, because I feel like the design of the new instruments, we're trying to know all these variations in the instrument, and there's only so stable you can make an instrument, and now we're realizing we've done as much as we can, and you still need to cut out data to understand the variations that you can't engineer out, right? And so it's the same thing with the key mode oscillations. Like, do you do yeah. better by trying to integrate over them, or do you do better by collecting the data you need to successfully model it out? Yeah. Like, we learned a ton about Kepler when it lost its pointing. We got a lot more information about Kepler. Similarly, with Express, I was trying to convince Deborah Fisher to throw the temperature. Hmm. Because if you throw the temperature, you can now see how the thing responds to the temperature change. But she was like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but you learn a lot, uh, and, and, and so I'm actually kind of against nulling. As you can tell from my attack, I'm against nulling. But, but in principle, if you can null, you know, like LIGO is a beautifully nulled experiment and you get all the data out of it by nulling. Yeah. But when thinking about the time sampling, what is actually realistic in terms of like how finely can we sample these things? I know, it's a great question. There's like things that are rotationally modulated. Yeah, you can hit them. Yeah. They have a long enough evolution time scale. So you can sample that well enough by hitting it once a night or something. But if you're going to try to sample features that are evolving on the course of like minutes, minutes. to hours to like a day or something, yeah. then like shit gets you, hard. Like how do we actually do that? Can you can you do it by saying, okay, we're gonna sample it once or twice, we're gonna sample it a lot for a little bit, but then once your cube like mode life comes apart, it's Separate. Yeah, can somebody just make sure that hits the notes because that's so important. Were you going to say something? Suzanne's on the stack. Suzanne. Um, so it was following up from what Heather is saying. And so, you know, we have, in the context of terror hunting, briefly opened that discussion and asked ourselves questions like, uh, it, it also applies to the, uh, if we, even if we don't consider short term things, but we want to extend, we want to be able to look at 80 stars and not 40. Can we do that by monitoring each star every night for a month, but then swapping to another group of star? Mm -hmm. And you know, and it, it it depends largely on whether I think my instinct is it depends on whether how much these processes that take place on different timescales affect each other. Mm -hmm. Because if you can, for example, get a really good picture of the statistical properties of granulation, not even the you know, not even, or if you're talking about oscillations, even if the mode lifetime is limited, if the statistical properties of the oscillations are stable over time, great. But what if they're affected by the activity not. cycle? Yeah, better not. Or, you know, that's the, that's where you have a problem. Yeah. Because okay. it would be great to One, yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking, uh, if you try to do something like that, for example, the thing you did that do an intensive campaign for a month to say the granulation, but then you stop and go for a different star, wouldn't you start losing also uh, sensitivity to what happened with rotation? Because maybe you didn't even cover a single rotation with that. What happens with instrumental stability, with the cycle of the star? So... Well, the idea would not be to drop that star. It would be to say, so let's say, for example, if you were worried about granulation, could you do uh, have uh, each star monitored continuously for a night now and then? In addition to its regular, right. or do K uh, observations every K nights instead of yeah. one observation or every something one. like that? So it, we were not thinking of just observing each star for a month and then not observing it at all, but simply of changing the cadence with which each star is observed. Yeah. And I would actually argue against doing that, at least initially, because we simply do not have the data to assess how well this strategy will work. Right. So my right. we have to take is that data. maybe we should observe a few stars continuously for a night in order to learn about graduation, 
But otherwise, we should observe every star in exactly the same way for at least a year or two or three. And then maybe we can try and get clever. Annalise and down, you three. Annalise first. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I'm pretty sure I put this in the slack yesterday already that, that it, 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 it does beg that question. How do you sample? But is it an issue that why would you be against sample for two months, three times a night, for example, uh, and then have a gap in order to keep the amount of stars that we have? Because we can be uh, the alternative would be dropping stars, but I don't think any of us want to do that necessarily. But uh, why would you be against having two months, three times a night in order to cover the relevant time scales and have a little gap then in order to do a couple other stars and then do it again. A lot of uh, could that could that potentially be better than doing all of them once a night? Yeah, so I can I can in order to have a more continuous flow. I guarantee you it's better, but a lot of people believe in uniform sampling, but they're wrong. You'll definitely be better with heterogeneous sampling. And that's something that's upsetting me about the current. But are you? Can you can you back that up? Right, we have to back it up. Yeah, we have to back it up. Yeah. I, I agree completely. I, I would argue that instead of coming up with sort of uh, ad hoc strategies, we yeah. need some side of some sort of adaptability as we go on, and we need adaptive scheduling because we're we're trying to say beforehand, okay, we're going to learn about this star X, A, B, and C way. And then, but we need, we need to be one, one month in, into our survey and we, okay, we know this part about the star, we've learned fairly well about that, let's learn another, another part about this star. So I think there's, there should be some kind of, we should work on that. I, I'm not yeah. sure if, 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 it, if it's proven that, that it's optimal or that it's better. But that's why it relates to all these other subjects, because it's what we learn about the latent structure of the stars that will tell us what the right sampling is. Yeah. But also, you Sabia, need to do it at I finally got to you. level. With many stars. Yeah, yeah. 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 survey level. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I would just say uh, it's a very pragmatic comment, but yeah. as an observer, <laughs> scheduling <laughs> I know, it's a telescope. I know. So I know that uh, I know. Tela that's crazy. would be a like, automatic telescope and so on. Yeah, yeah. But you start to arrive with I know. perfect sampling. Yeah, with Instead of yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Only thing on and then you okay. also leave. I mean, you are never able to get what you want. Exactly. You can't, so, so everything has to be robust to actual scheduling capabilities. So in the end, I really feel like you experiment. Let's hit the stars as much as we can, not having too much constraint. Because the weather will do this. For sure. Because the weather will do a lot for us. And we benefit a lot. We, astronomers think they hate the weather, but actually the weather helps us often because of exactly this. Um, I want to say one more thing. You want to say something? Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Just one comment on the. And then I want to say one more thing. Um, so something the, exactly. the different time scales of the star. Yeah. Uh, if, if we model granulation with an exponential kernel or with, with a, a correlated noise which decreases over time, then I don't understand the argument that we should take several points per night. Because if the noise is correlated, if you take the measurement right after the other uh, one, mm -hmm. If, if it was bright, you don't really, get more information. You don't get any more information. That's why astro-seismic is so interesting, because the correlations yeah. go negative, so you... Yeah, yeah exactly, but, but I mean... If, if you talk, learn the... You have to learn those kernels. Yes, but, but I mean, yeah. if we want to learn the time scale of this of this kernel so that we can use it in the Tarantin experiment or to, to improve our models, that's one thing. But if we want to find the optimal sampling strategy for uh, a given star, probably, we want to space the, uh, we, we want to set and space between observations because uh, taking it within the same night is just it's actually a bad idea. I agree. The, the, the no, next no. scales we're talking about are minutes, not minutes. right. But still, but, yeah. okay. I want to say I'm going to abuse my privilege because I want I want to just say one more thing. We won't have time to discuss it, but I want to say it because it's kind of I think it's important from a methodological point of view. So I want to say it, and then if we have a little more time. And that is, everyone in this room is doing causal inference, and causal inference is actually a very hard thing to do. If you talk to the statistics community, they'll be like, you can't separate the causes if you can't do experiments, and hella, we can't do experiments. Like, literally, we, we call it the terror hunting experiment, but that is a misnomer. It's the terror hunting okay. field work. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, there's been tons of causal statements in this meeting, and I believe some of them uh, about this, like, like very nice things. 
uh, about about what's the instrument versus what's the star, and very nice things about what's activity versus a true radial velocity signal, or spot, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say activity. And, um, uh, and, and the reason it works, I think, is because everything has low dimensional structure. And so it's possible to see the differences of the things because they have different structure and you often have housekeeping data. I wanted to show you a picture because I wanted to just emphasize the, the impressiveness of causal inference. This is the, from the Wable paper. This is my favorite figure from the Wable paper and everyone who knows me has seen this figure a million times. What we did, in the, this is 51 peg, this is Barnard star. We took a set of observations. This is Megan Bedell's paper. I, I just erased, the, well, the, the reference just went off the screen. Um, ah, ah, anyway, I'm not gonna, um, and in both cases, we learned this model with no preconceptions about it and this model with no preconceptions about it. And over here, we did the same. And these two inferences are independent. There's no relationship between these two inferences. In this spectrum, we could tell that these are telluric lines with those depths. See, that's impressive. And, I'm sorry, I'm talking about my own work and I'm saying it. <laughs> It is impressive because it shows that the housekeeping data we have, what's the housekeeping data we have? We know, the, we know that the, the atmosphere is at zero velocity and the star is moving. And so that separates causally the star from the atmosphere. So this is a beautiful example that shows you that when things have low dimensional structure and you have housekeeping data that separate effects, you can separate the effects. That should be somehow, for me, this is the motivation for thinking about all the things. Shouldn't we be able to now then separate it out into granulation signal, activity signal? Uh, uh, like this should become a ton of models, right? That are all the physical things that are going on at the start. I think we're out of time, but yeah. I, I agree that this is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time though, isn't it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't one of the reasons that this works is because the blue thing shifts with 60 kilometers per second, whilst granulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will not. Good. The, 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 these things separate because the star and the atmosphere, because we're on the Earth, which is apparently unpleasant for some people, it's great for me, um, moves the atmosphere's velocity relative to the star's velocity, or you can think of it the other way around, special relativity, general relativity. Um, but, uh, but now, so now how would we separate the other things? Well, people are already doing this, right? Because they have some bisector or something they use for activity, and then they correlate things with activity, and they say, oh, well, this signal in the periodogram isn't from the true Doppler shift because it correlates with some activity indicator. That's actually the same as this. It's just in a different space. It's just not in the spectral domain. It's in the time domain and in time and with some other housekeeping data. So here you can think of the radial velocity of the star as like housekeeping data that separates the star from the atmosphere. So that in, like for this separation, the radial velocities are the housekeeping data. But then this separation is the housekeeping data for when you're measuring the radial velocities. You change your viewpoint. But, but, so that, but you're asking exactly the right question. Are there observational handles that separate the things that we can use to do these kinds of source separations? How, That's what I'm asking. How precisely do you need and, to? And how precisely do you need to know them exactly? Here, we obviously need to know things very precisely for this to work. Uh, uh, but. Fundamentally, this is like causal inference and it does relate. And, and I really love both of these talks were, were showing so beautifully that periodogram peaks were not Doppler. Beautifully. And it's like, wow, that's causal inference. And it was very convincing. It wasn't subtle. It's like, boom, the peaks disappeared. That's, that's really unusual. And the physics humanity, they'd be like, can you explain more about how you did that? <laughs> um, and so I'd like us to, to think in that kind of language. Uh, I think it would be useful. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm over. Yeah, I'm afraid that we need to finish this yeah. interesting conversation, but I'm sure we can keep the conversation by lunch. So let's thank again, Hub.